Hello everybody, it's your girl Carla Renata, aka the Kirby Film Critic, again from my humble abode. Hope you all had a very joyous, safe, and happy holiday season thus far with Hanukkah and Kwanzaa and Christmas on the horizon or in the middle of or about to end, wherever you may be in that process. I wish you so much joy, peace, and happiness going into 2020. Now, I promised y'all the best of The Curvy Critic in 2019, and I just have to say, when I started going back through all the footage, I realized that I had so many interviews. I talked to Regina King. I talked to Regina Hall. I talked to Tim Story. I spoke with Sterling K. Brown four times. Four times, but that's my St. Louis homie, so there's that. I spoke with his wife, Ryan Bathay. I spoke with so many people and I'm so grateful and so humbled that they allowed me to interview them, among other things. I have some brand new interviews for you with Brie Larson and Karen Kendrick from Just Mercy, along with Tim Blake Nelson and Rob Morgan from Just Mercy. It opened on Christmas Day. It goes nationwide on January 5th. So you have that to look forward to if you are in a city where it is not currently playing. Um, and so what I did was, is I split the, the best of the Kirby Critic right here at Black Hollywood Live. I split it, split it up into a couple of different categories. So the first category we're going to jump into is the director category. And, um, I spoke with Matthew Cherry, Matthew A. Cherry and Peter Ramsey about being unique what it's, what it's like to be unique. And if you're not familiar with them, Matthew Cherry actually is a former football player who became an animator. And Peter Ramsey won the Oscar for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So I feel like I'm kind of good luck for Peter if he's working with Matthew. Ho hopefully Matthew will win the Oscar for his short that is out right now and is on the short list for the Oscars. It's called Hair Love. So take a listen to this snippet, snippet, snippet of what they told me about what it's like to be unique. Peter, you mm -hmm. won the Oscar for Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Congratulations on that. Thank I saw you. you a lot during that award season. I was so <laughs> excited. Much. I was so excited. <laughs> but the message in Hair Love is pretty much the same message in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, that your uniqueness is the thing that makes you special. Mm -hmm. I wanted you both to speak about that particular thing and the fact, you know, you're taking gender norms and doing mm -hmm. some interesting things with them. So I wanted you guys both to speak to that for a second, if you might. Yeah, for me, you know, on that score, you know, just the idea on the gender norms thing it's like I mean that's love you know you do what you your parent you're a man or a woman you're a father or a mother you step up and do what you can to help someone you love in this case you help them show their love so the whole thing is all about expression and, and you know passing things passing something down from one generation to another in the black community the whole issue of hair you know it means so many different things there's so many yeah, different issues tied up with it that this was such an elegant way of like getting to the heart of what what it really is all about which is ex just ex self-expression and love kind of put together in one Okay. Yeah, you know, I think for us, our whole idea with this was just like kind of similar to how Peter said was Zuri, she has a goal in the beginning of this, you know, she wants her hair done for a very specific reason, mm -hmm. you know, dad wasn't really listening to her initially. And, um, you know, by the end of it, he uh, finally listened to her and he was able to figure it out. And it's really just about, I think, what parents, be that a mom or a dad, it's just what parents do for their kids when they love them unconditionally. And it's like, all right, I may not know how to do this, but you want me to do it and I'm going to try to learn the best way I know how and I'm going to do my best. You know, luckily he had uh, some, some videos that he could kind of learn step by step how to do it. And, you know, I just think for us, we just wanted to represent for, you know, groups of people that you don't really see in this light. At the time when we did the Kickstarter campaign, you know, this article had come out, I think it was through Mike.com, where it was talking about how African-American men are actually one of the most involved groups of people involved in their kids' lives. But there was always a stereotype that, you know, black men weren't uh, present in their kids' lives. And so, you know, we just wanted to really help to show a narrative that you don't really see every day and I think that's part of the reason why so many people connected with it. Hey so I hope you enjoyed that little walk down memory lane. If you um have not been here before this is the Kirby Critic with Carla Renata. I am your host Carla Renata. Click right down below for the subscribe button and you will get notifications for when we go live. Sometimes when I do these remotes we go up on time sometimes we don't. Sometimes it's a time factor sometimes it's a uploading factors sometimes it's, you know technology might betray me whatever the case is but i always try to get it to you nevertheless so again 
click the subscribe button and you will get all the notifications for when it does go up, whether it goes up on time or not. <laughs> but I try my best to make it go up on time. Um, the next director that I spoke to was Ron Howard, and he had done a documentary about Luciano Pavarotti. And I love Pavarotti because I love opera and I loved his voice so, 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 so much. And I spoke with him about a little, little thing that I noticed about the film. Um, take a listen to that as well. I love that when it tr the last line of the song translates to I will win, yeah. which is what he did over and over and over again in his life. Through that joy, you know, the great thing is that you didn't feel like he was some sort of, uh, you know, like ambitious, you know, animal, monster, <laughs> who's just, I'm going to, no matter what, I have to succeed. It, it's, it's really that he just, you know, he would, he would throw his focus on something, whether it was the music, whether it was a relationship, whether it was philanthropy, whether it was his kids at a certain point, and he'd go all in, and, and it would be this sort of, um, this pursuit of, of, of joy and, and just what he thought was the right thing to do as a person, and that's how he would win, which is, I respect. He says, with his stage fright, I go to die, <laughs> which made me laugh out loud because I'm a singer and I have immensely horrible stage fright. Yeah. So I was wondering, when you're doing your films and you're about to shoot for the first time on any given project, do you have a saying that you kind of say to yourself before you start? When I'm feeling overwhelmed, I just focus and I say, okay, what's my job today? Because I like to distill it down to work. I've grown up doing this stuff. Absolutely. You know, and so if I can just remember, you know, what... What's, what's, what are we supposed to be doing right now? Let's put everything else aside for just a minute and get focused on that. That gives me a kind of peace of mind and a little equilibrium, and we do that. And of course, I'm not an opera singer. I don't have to do it alone. I get to do it with a fantastic group of unbelievably talented, committed artists and, and, and technicians. And uh, so I love, I love being on the team and sometimes leading the team. I'm hoping that we get to a day where it isn't female filmmaker and male filmmaker, it's just filmmaker. So do you feel, what, how do you feel about this whole dysfunction thing that's happening in the filmmaking world as it pertains to female film critics yeah. and female filmmakers? Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with you completely because, you know, I think craft is colorblind. When I'm approaching a film, I look at all kinds of films as references and, and more films that are interesting in terms of style, right? And I don't necessarily look at a film based on the culture that it's more about how do I frame a shot? What are some of the family films that inspire me? How do I do comedy in a way that hasn't been done before? How do I show pathos and humor in the same frame? And I can draw from, you know, all kinds of influences. So I think it's tricky when someone says, how do you make a Asian American family drama? To me, Asian American isn't a genre, you know, it's a filmmaking. It's a human. It's a human. It's a type of human. Well, what's a white drama look like, you know? <laughs> I don't, those filmmakers don't go into telling a story thinking about identity. In many ways, when I was approaching this film about my family, I just set out a film to tell a story about a, a granddaughter and a grandmother, a, a film about family and about loss and about grief and about guilt when you leave. We don't look at ourselves every day and go, oh my gosh, I'm Asian. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I overstand, yes, I overstand. <laughs> I don't look in the mirror and go, oh, I am a black girl. What have happened? Yeah, no. exactly. <laughs> no. And how do I? I, you know, do something really, you know, Asian today. Um, I, I think about uh, Hannah Gatsby's Nanette because I watched it recently and I loved it so much. And she said that she's had feedback where people go, there was just not enough lesbian content in your show. And she's like, I'm, I'm confused. I was on stage the entire time. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yes, the, the story is, is about an Asian American family because that is the texture of my life. That is who I am. Every story I tell is an Asian American story because I am, that is my voice. I can't escape. So in high school, what was the most reckless thing that you can remember you did? I went to boarding school. Mm -hmm. And I, my best friend and I left uh, the countryside of boarding school life to take the train to New York City uh -huh. where we went in and I got a really terrible tattoo. Oh. <laughs> I was 13. This is why 13 year olds should not choose their own tattoos or get them at all. Share what it was. It's really bad. It's still on my body. <laughs> of oh course it no. Is. It's a dragon oh. that's spinning fire but the fire is also a shark and it represents wow. earth, wind, and fire. And it's so bad. She it goes. I started with the fire. <laughs> it represents like I mean, it's that time in my life. It was an adventurous time. Being young is wonderful, 
but it was a bad idea. But it made me start the Bad Tattoo Club. So if you have any bad tattoos that you want to share. Yeah, I'm needle phobic. I can't, I can't roll. You can't be in my club. I, I can't be there. We've talked to all our directors. We've talked to all our actresses. And, well, not all of our actresses, but my biggest actress that I talked to. And, yeah, this is Black Hollywood Live. But, you know, film is universal, just like music is. So sometimes when I talk about films here, they won't necessarily always be an African-American film. Although I do try my best to put a spotlight on those films because other than here, they may not get a spotlight. So that is my job and I try to do that to the best of my ability. But I'm going to give Miss Scarlett Johansson a big ups. Now, you know, Scarlett Johansson has been very controversial over the last couple of um, months or so. You know, she had controversy over that trans trying to take the trans role. She had controversy over her opinion regarding Woody Allen. Miss Girl does not shy away from controversy, but you got to give it to her for, you know, standing her ground and not, not backtracking or backing up. Now, she did apologize for some of the things that she said, but I think she apologized just because she felt like she needed to, not necessarily because she was backtracking on what she said. She didn't backtrack on what she said. She just apologized for what she said, so... Take it however you want. Um, now, next up, I told you at the beginning, I did some interviews. I was flown to New York and did some interviews with uh, the cast of Just Mercy and the creative Brian Stevenson, who the book Just Mercy and the film is based on his life as a legal eagle on death row. So I spoke with Brie Larson and Karen Kendrick about their stance on capital punishment and prison reform. Take a listen. What's going on? <laughs> What's up, my sisters? Hi. I'm so excited to talk to you today. I love this film. Thank you. Really, really love it. And I have a, a personal, visceral reaction to it mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons. But <clears throat> personal I want stance. your personal stance on capital punishment versus prison reform. Having this time with Brian, and it's been an invaluable couple of years with him. Um, has really helped me to understand what kind of system we've created. And it's not a system that is providing service and help to others. And that is what my interest is. My interest is in uplifting. It's, I don't feel that um, putting people in a space where they're just forgotten helps anybody. <clears throat> so that's my stance. Okay, Karen? Um, when I sit with men and women and children who are system impacted, whether it is in community or inside of a prison or a rehabilitation center, what I realize is that there are some really big topics, big you know, ideas, big buzzwords, but then there's a very human element, there's a very human component what I hope this film will do is help us to cut through bureaucracy and cut through, and everybody can serve from where they stand. But from where I stand, it's about serving humanity. It's about understanding that people are not the definition of the worst thing they've ever done. People are connected in ways that we choose to not see. Once you see this film, you can't be this <sighs> now I have to say this was the first time I had a chance to interview Brie Larson face to face since she won the Oscar and I have to say things have changed a little bit she's a little more mature a little more grounded this time around whereas when I interviewed her right after the Oscar you know she was it was an out-of-body experience you just won an Oscar you don't know your head from a hole in the ground and she's really really young but she's grown into she, I, I should say she's grown into her womanhood is where she is. She's grown into her womanhood. So it was nice to see her again and nice to speak with her. It was also really nice to talk to Karen Kendrick because she's such a smart cookie and such a phenomenal actress. I, I enjoyed her immensely. Next up is Rob Morgan and Tim Blake Nelson. Now, if you know either one of these names, it is because Tim Blake Nelson is also in The Watchmen. He's also that dude that's saying, you know that film, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, that had a lot of heat on it a little while ago? Well, Tim is the cowboy singing that flawless song at the beginning. So, of course, when I interviewed, who, interviewed him, I had to say something about it. And Rob Morgan is playing Herb Richardson, who is one of the people that was on death row that Brian Stevenson was defending. 
And when I tell you Rob Morgan is giving a phenomenally grounded, heartfelt performance, I kid you not. He should really um, be in a place where he's being rewarded for his work because he's been around for a minute and we just haven't seen him get his props the way that he should. So take a look and a listen to the interview with Just Mercies, Tim Blake Nelson, and Rob Morgan. Hello, gentlemen. Hey, so wonderful to see you. I enjoyed your performances in this film so much. Oh, thank so you. much, so much, so thank much. You. And I really liked you in um, Ballad of Buster Scruggs, busting out that song. Yes. Thank you. Yes. yes. I said the same yes. thing. I loved you for that. I like, you, you just have such a really wide range. I love that. Um, there's a moment in the film where your character, Herb Richardson, talks about his last day alive. If this was your last day alive, what would you guys want, want that to consist of? I'd be with my boys and my wife. Uh, it's, it's hands down. Uh, and I'd, I'd spend every minute with them. Aww. How about you, Rob? Yeah, I'd probably be with my mom. I'm not married, I don't have kids. So I, I thought can't. you were going to say, I want to be with Tim and his boys and his wife. I want to be with Tim and his boys and his wife. Exactly, that's what I want to be. We think you feel well. I'll bring my mom and hang out with Tim and his boys and his wife. Yeah. <laughs> so you be with your mom. All right, I'm going to It's all good, brother. My goodness. The more the merrier. Oh, how much did you guys know about your individual cases that are reflected in the film before you started doing the film? I didn't know much about it at all as far as Herbert Richardson. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know cases of actual brothers and sisters in my own life, but uh, for this particular person, Herbert Richardson, I discovered it in Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy, mm -hmm. and countless of other brothers and brothers that was in the book, but uh, that's how I discovered Herbert Richardson. I'll just say that he obviously knew about this character in ways he didn't even know because of the performance he gives. It's just so tender and sensitive. Uh, I didn't know about um, Ralph Myers, uh, but, I, but I did grow up, I grew up somewhat privileged in, um, in Oklahoma in the Southwest, but I knew characters like Ralph Myers to a degree, uh, but it was really the exposure of him it, in such a uh, an artfully intelligent and sympathetic way by Brian Stevenson and then Dustin Daniel Cretton and Andrew Lanham in the script uh, that really invited me into this character. Now that you've been part of this journey, what does Just Mercy mean for you? Just Mercy for me means an opportunity for us to start having a conversation that could create some positive change. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. This particular movie there. Uh, tikkun Olam, which is uh, Hebrew, and it means repair the world. Mm. Ooh, I like that. Mm -hmm. You're a deep brother. Uh, that's what we so need deep. to do. <laughs> <laughs> you are deep. Well, that is my time, gentlemen. I appreciate you so much for sitting down and talking oh. to me. It's been my pleasure. Nice meeting you. Yes, nice meeting you, yeah. too. Nice. You know, I always have a little fun with my interviews, and because I can sing, sometimes, you know, depending on who it is, I might bust out a song here and there. But um, I had some fun last weekend with uh, Jamie Foxx and Michael B. Jordan singing Happy Birthday to Them. Um, I had some fun singing some Frozen stuff with Bobby Lopez and Kristen Anderson Lopez. And in case you missed them, here's a little fun clip from, you know, the fun side of the Curvy Critic. <laughs> Hollywood Live. Hey. Um, <laughs> So, gentlemen. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes, ma I know you had a birthday in February, mm -hmm. and I, you, ha you had a birthday a couple days ago. I had a birthday in February? No, he, he a, had a birthday in February. It's coming up. You know what? You had one a couple of days ago. Right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So, this is for, this is for both of y'all. Happy birthday oh, to sure. you. Oh, sure. Get it in. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. Yeah. All right. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Get it on in. Oh, my yeah. God. Could you break off a little bit of Into the Unknown for me real quick? Sure. sure. Um, we've uh, had about, my adventure. Yeah. I've had my adventure. I don't need something new. I'm afraid of what I'm risking if I follow you into the unknown. Into the unknown. You take it.
Now, as I mentioned earlier, I have interviewed Sterling K. Brown four times just this year. The first time was at the Spirit Awards nominee brunch, I believe it was. The second time was for Angry Birds 2. The third time was for Waves. And the last and final time was for Frozen 2. <laughs> but I love how when I tried to ask him about uh, Frozen 2, not by name, he gave me this answer. What's up, my St. Louis What's homie? What's going on, sister? I was so excited to see that you were doing a voice in Angry Birds too. It's fun. Gary, the scientific dude. Yeah. How much you know about science? I know a little bit. Oh, really? I know a little bit. I, you know, I did well in my physics in high school. I got an A in that, A in bio. Got a thing, I got a B plus in chemistry. Like, I was a solid student. I was oh. good. Oh, okay. I went to Stanford. Oh, well, then there's that. You got to do, you got to do all right. You got to do all right. There's, there's that. And you're about to do another one, too. You're about to do another animated project, too. I know you can't talk about it, but... I have no idea what you mean. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I will throw some clips up during the week um, until we come back live on January 5th. And January 5th is actually the day of the Golden Globes. I will not be attending the ceremony, not yet anyway. But I will be attending the after festivities and I can uh, report to you about that and let you know what's happening. And uh, yeah, and maybe I have a maybe a little birdie will give me a little more insight into what might be going down this award season. So I'll come back the following week and we'll talk about the results of the Golden Globes because after the Golden Globes is full throttle after that because after the Golden Globes, we have the SAG Awards, we have the Critics' Choice Awards, we have some of the regional awards, Santa Barbara Film Festival, and all those things um, have a tendency to temper or give you some type of insight into who may possibly win the Oscar for 2020. Now, I'm going to tell you, it's kind of all over the place right now. People are winning all kinds of things, and I'll get into that when I get into the awards scoreboard in a little bit. But what I do want to get into right now is I realize that this is the end of a decade. When we go into 2020 in a couple of days, it will be the end of a decade. So I wanted to highlight some of my favorite films within the last 10-year period. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the films that aren't necessarily the ones that a lot of other critics or influencers are highlighting because I like the ones that have people of color in them. And I think sometimes those films often get overlooked or forgotten about. So one film I know is not forgotten about is Black Panther. Black Panther shattered, just shattered box office records all around the world. It was directed by Ryan Coogler. It starred a plethora of different stars um, led by Michael B. Jordan. And um, it was the first time we'd ever seen a black Marvel comic superhero on the silver screen. We'd seen Black Widow. We'd seen Iron Man. We'd seen the Hulk. We'd seen all these other iconic comic book characters, but we had never seen someone of color or a woman. So we got... Um, Captain Marvel this year and we got Black Panther this year all in the same year so it was a great year at, at Marvel Studios <laughs> um, but let me finish talking about Black Panther. Black Panther was important. It was important for the reasons I just mentioned and it was important because there's a whole new generation now that's going to grow up knowing that if you are a woman you don't have to rely on a man to do anything. The women in Black Panther they were smart they were savvy, they were elegant, they were classy, they had everything going for them. And the men didn't, and the men respected them, respected their opinions and respected their, their purpose in their lives. So I love Black Panther just for that reason that it gives that message among others. So that is why it is at the top of my best of the decade, um, 2010 decade list. The next one that I want to talk about is a film called 20 Feet from Stardom. Now, I remember when I reviewed this, I said that I knew quite a few of the women that were featured in there because I too used to be a background vocalist for a very small, minute period of time um, in between gigs. But nevertheless, I did it and it, <coughs> excuse me, and it literally is 20 Feet from Stardom. And um, this particular film focused on Lisa Fisher, Mary Clayton, Darlene Love, and uh, some other, a lot of other, other, other um, 
background vocalist. But shortly after the film won its Oscar, Mary Clayton succumbed to a stroke from which I don't believe she's recovered. So we're going to send prayers and thoughts and positivity out to her. But 20 feet from stardom, if you are interested in a career in background singing, or if you just want to see what it's like to be behind somebody on a microphone and see what kind of sacrifices you have to make to your own career and what kind of sacrifices you have to make as an artist. Because if you're singing backup for somebody, that means you can't really fully pursue your creativity as an artist and they talk about all of that in that film but it, it it was it was a wonderful wonderful documentary and everybody that loved it I mean everybody that watched it enjoyed it so first Black Panther now 20 feet from stardom and the next one I want to talk about is Belle Gugu Mbata Ra is one of my favorite young actresses because her range is unsurmountable. She literally can do just about anything. And then Belle, you know, we know about Meghan Markle and, and her being the, the first American that is um, of um, black descent to become a princess. But baby, there was a princess before <laughs> Meghan Markle over there. You know Queen Elizabeth got a little drop of black blood in her. Did you know that? Watch, and if you don't know that, watch the film Bell because when you see the film Bell, then you will see exactly what I mean. And I won't even tell you which queen it was that had a little black in her, but yeah. So this Bell was based on a true story. Gugu and Bhaktara does a wonderful job portraying her. Ama Asante is the director. It's just a gorgeously shot film. Uh, a very prolific story that is told historically that we that I didn't know about. I'm sure you don't know either. So if you have some time over over the rest of the holiday season, check it out. Bell, Fruitvale Station. There's going to be a couple of films on this list that I'm going to mention that involve Michael B. Jordan because he's just the the man of the decade. He had Creed. He had Fruitvale Station. He had Black Panther. He was he's producing more films. He's the producer on Just Mercy. But Fruitvale Station gutted me to my core because there was nothing worse than seeing this young man named Oscar lose his life on the BART subway platform because somebody just wanted to mess with some young black kid one day. It was just, and he, 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 was on a, he was on a wrong path. He ended up turning his life around and he was right in the middle of that when his life was snuffed short. But Fruitvale Station stars Michael B. Jordan and Octavia Spencer. It is a wonderful film. It came out in 2013. And so did Belle and Star, uh, 20 Feet from Stardom. And it, it's just a beautiful film. You might want to check that out as well. Straight Outta Compton in 2015. I talked about this as well. Straight Outta Compton is a loosely based true story of NWA, a rap group in the like 80s or 90s, um, and it starred Corey and uh, Jason Mitchell and Ice Cube's son, O'Shea Johnson. Now, this is the thing. So, since 20 Feet from, uh, 20 Feet from Star, since Straight From Compton came out, Jason Mitchell's star had ascended quite brightly. He was in a movie that came out this year called The Mustang. He was in The Shy on Showtime. Like he, he was in Mudbound. He was in a plethora of films that were making his stars shine so brightly and 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 you know, boosting him up the the ladder. But there were some shenanigans with him earlier this year. He lost his gig at The Shy. He lost his representation. Shortly after that, he went on somebody's radio show and tried to defend himself, which always is never a good idea um, because it just makes the situation worse. Um, but it's unfortunate because he's, he was such a nice brother and he was so, so, so talented. But his work in Straight Outta Compton was really quite lovely. Unfortunately, Straight Outta Compton, even though it helped get Paramount Pictures in the black for the rest of the year, it got no love awards wise except for through our own community so but if you have not seen straight out of compton check it out it, i'm sure you can stream it or it's on blu-ray and dvd there is another film that i loved called i am not your negro is a 2016 documentary about james baldwin 
And James Baldwin came up twice in this decade, um, especially with the adaptation, the Barry Jenkins adaptation of If Beale Street Could Talk, where Regina King won the Oscar for that. So I Am Not Your Negro is based on a book by James Baldwin. And the whole documentary is bu uh, built around that. Raul Peck is the director of that. And it basically is like a, a, a calling card or a shout out to the new activists of this generation, you know, giving them a playbook from which to generate their, what do I want to, what do I want to say? A playbook to generate their, their, their call to action. That's what I want to say. To generate their call to action, a new playbook for the, the activists at this time to generate their call of action. It's, it was wonderfully done. I, I love that documentary a lot. And you hear me talk about documentaries on, on this show quite a bit. Three other ones that I want to talk about really briefly are Hidden Figures, Moonlight, and Best Man Wedding. Now, I remember with Best Man Wedding, I remember seeing Nia Long on a TV show. As, as a matter of fact, I remember seeing anybody that was in this movie on TV shows talking about the fact that the studio actually made them do a read-through of the script before they would approve the film to be done, which was kind of insulting and annoying all at the same time because by the time Best Man Holiday had rolled around, the director, Malcolm D. Lee, who was Spike Lee's cousin, Nia Long, uh, Terrence Howard, Tay Diggs, Monica Calhoun, Sanaa Lathan, <laughs> Harold Perrinaugh Jr., all of these actors had resumes that were as long as my arm, just long. And the fact that any studio would, would require them to do a table read in order to green light a film is absolutely ridiculous. I can't even believe they did that. But guess what? The film, Malcolm and the Stars had the last laugh because it was the highest grossing movie toward the end, that quarter of the year. So there you go. I bet they won't be asking for no more table reads for Black Cast from now on, especially behind that and Black Panther. No, ma'am, no, sir. We don't need to do that ever again. Hidden Figures. Now, as I've said this about so many films it seems like in the last decade we got a lot of films that came out that were teaching us history lessons through film things that i'd never heard about until i saw it in a movie things like uh hidden figures like these these women astronauts who were human computers that were the ones that were responsible for generating the math to help the astronauts get from point a to point b and then back again so i i just hate when um we're not given the facts, um, films like Green Book that I, I learned about, you know, this, this man who was traveling the country as a, a, a concert pianist who was driven around by a white man. I had no idea that that was going on. I had no idea that man existed before that film came out. So I just have a really big problem with learning history in film. I don't mind learning it actually, but I just wish that our educational system here in America was better so that I learned it in school and not in a movie. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, yeah, so those are some of my picks for the decade that I really enjoyed. And I hope you enjoy them too. If you haven't seen them or if you'd like to see them, please take a note of what the ones that I mentioned. I can go back through that list one more time and tell you that they are Best Man Holiday, Black Panther, 20 Feet from Stardom, If Beale Street Could Talk, Bell, Fruitvale Station, Straight Outta Compton, I Am Not Your Negro, Hidden Figures, and Moonlight. I think I said those before. Oh, but I did leave two off. I left, I left three off, actually. Get Out, Loose, and um, Mudbound. I talked about Mudbound a little bit. Um, that it resulted in Mary J. Blige getting her first Oscar nomination. It was dealing about black mental health. It was that was a wonderful film. I really love that film. Um, Loose. Oh, I've talked about Loose a lot this year. Kelvin Harrison Jr. Kelvin Harrison Jr. is having a really good year, y'all. He is in uh, The Godfather of Harlem on Epics. He did Loose. 
He was the lead in Loose. He was the lead in Waves. He's just having a really good year. But Loose was one of those films that, again, made you think way after the credits went off. Julius Ona was the director of that. I had an opportunity to moderate a panel with them. And I moderated a lot of panels this year, which was really cool. But that film is really good. Um, so check all those movies out if you get an opportunity. Now, let's talk about this award season. Um... What I did was, is I went through the list because this particular award season is shorter, it's tighter, and it's a little more stressful because when you don't have a lot of time to really sit down and look at all of the, the full list of films, that's a problem, mostly because... It doesn't give you a whole lot of time to think about how you want to vote, who you want to vote. It just, you know, it becomes problematic. So having said that, I broke these down um, in terms of their Rotten Tomato score and how many wins across the country, film critic group wise or film group wise or, you know, BAFTA or not BAFTA, but like Hollywood critics or stuff like that. Um, how many people have, how many film, how many films have won what? So, and I may not get through all of them today. I may just save half of them for next week so that we can talk about the Golden Globes a little bit more. But I also want to say that because the season is so tight, they pushed, the Academy has pushed back the scientific and technical Oscars until June 2020. Because there's just not enough time to really sit down and look at everything. And usually... The Golden Globes is always the first Sunday in January, and with the Oscars being the first week in February, ooh, it's just a really, really short window. The BAFTA is one week before the Oscars, so that's the end of January, right? So you got the Golden Globes at the beginning of January, you got the BAFTA at the end of January, and now the Santa Barbara Film Festival is now in the middle of January rather than in February because the Oscars are in February. You see what I'm saying? It's a lot going on. Okay, so let's start with Parasite. Parasite tops the list with a record 40 wins and a 99% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And most of their awards have gone, awards and nominations have been for Best Director, Best Foreign Film, and Best Screenplay. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has had 28 wins with an 85% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And most of their awards and or nominations have been in the categories of Best Supporting Actor, Best Soundtrack, Best Best Youth Performer, Best Screenplay, Best Production Design, Best Director, Best Picture, and Best Cinematographer. The Irishman has 24 wins thus far with a 96% rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And they have been winning and or been nominated for Best Director, Editing, Supporting Actor, and Adapted Screenplay. Marriage Story, 26 wins with a 95% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, has been nominated or has won Best Actor, Best Supporting Actress, Best Original Screenplay throughout the country. I would say it's a best bet that those first four films that I read off are going to do really well when it comes to the Oscar nominations, which will be coming out shortly. Next is Little Women and Knives Out. Both got a total of 15 wins, and their score was somewhere between... 94% and 97% um, and Knives Out has been generally been getting nominations and or winning for Best Ensemble and Original Screenplay Play, excuse me um, Us, oh I forgot about Us Us is in that category too um, Us has been getting Best Actress for Lupita Nyong'o and Little Women, Best Supporting Actress for Laura Dern and Best Adapted Screenplay. Uncut Gems has had 12 wins with a 93% Rotten Tomato score. And its only category that they seem to get any love in is Best Actor for Adam Sandler. 1917 has a 90% Rotten Tomato score, 12 wins, and it is being uh, considered for Best Cinematography and or winning Best Film across the country. Apollo 11, the documentary, 99% Rotten Tomato score with 10 wins and basically is in the Best Documentary category. Toy Story 4, 97% Rotten Tomato score, 8 wins. Of course, Best Animated Film, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, 97% Rotten Tomato score, 8 wins. Best LGBTQ, Foreign Film, Actress, and Cinematography, Judy, an 83% Rotten Tomato score, 8 wins, and basically people are looking at Judy for Renee Zellweger's performance and the hair and makeup that turned her into Judy Garland. The Nightingale, 87% Rotten Tomato, 7 wins, 
Best Supporting Actress Casting, Directing, Picture, and Screenplay. So we'll, it'll be interesting to see how they fare. For Sama, we did an interview with those directors and producers earlier this year right here on Black Hollywood Live. It has had a 99% rating on Rotten Tomatoes with seven wins, and it has won and or is being nominated for Best Doc Editing, Foreign Film, and Director. Pain and Glory got a 97% Rotten Tomato score and has six wins, basically for Foreign Film and Best Actor for Antonio Banderas. Jojo Rabbit, a 79% Rotten Tomato score, six wins, and basically has been nominated or has won across the country Best Comedy, Supporting Actress, Young Performer, and Best Picture. Ford versus Ferrari, 97, 97, 92% uh, Rotten Tomato score with six wins. And basically, people are looking to that film for best editing. Now, this is my opinion thus far. I'm kind of annoyed that Dolomite is my name is not doing better. I'm kind of annoyed that Eddie Murphy is not getting any love. I'm kind of annoyed that there are 10 female filmmakers who all of their films were excellent and some in some instances better than their male counterparts and only two of them, maybe three, are even getting considered. Um, Lorraine Shama, it, Lorraine Shama, the director for Hustlers, she's not, they're not even taking her seriously. The only thing they're talking about with regard to Hustlers is Jennifer Lopez. Um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire, Celine Shama, that's who I was thinking about. Um, she's not even being entered into the category. Lulu Wang's heat had, for The Farewell has drastically died down. So has Olivia Wilde's heat for Booksmart drastically dialed down. So I just, I, it's like when I was talking to Lulu Wang earlier and we were talking about how I, how she feels about the disparity with female film, filmmakers. I'm really hoping that that disparity as well as the, the disparity when it comes to to female critics of color, how that, uh, hopefully all of that will change and it will shift. Now, I usually have a, a plethora, that's all I'm going to say about the awards right now. I'll do a more in-depth thing in the next couple of weeks leading up to the Oscars. Um, and, and I will be going to Sundance, so there's that. And I'll be reporting from there. Um, I do want to address a little bit of news because this week was particularly stressful and interesting because the Sundance Film Festival has been doing this diversity initiative and the diversity initiative originally was established to create opportunities for women filmmakers, filmmake not filmmakers, women, female critics, critics of color, LGBTQ critics and influencers who under any other circumstances would not be able to afford to go on the mountain for the festival since it is one of the biggest film festivals of the year. And a lot of the films that we see during Sundance in the Toronto Film Festival and Telluride Film Festival usually end up being in the Oscar race. This year, not so much, but most of the time that is the case. I would say at least 40 people that I knew that were that are people of color or in or LGBTQ or trans applied for the diversity initiative and they were not approved. Um, it was a big deal this week and a lot of people ended up having to create GoFundMe accounts, which thank goodness, thankfully, most of their GoFundMe accounts did really well and they were able to get funded and um, get be able to go to Sundance regardless. But I'm thinking that the festival probably needs to reevaluate what their criteria is for those initiatives, maybe create a different deadline or something, because I know a lot of them applied in October and then they weren't told until like right before the holidays that they hadn't been approved. So maybe they could find some kind of way to tell you a little bit earlier so that you know you can try to get it together. But as for me, I usually try to get my stuff together in July just to back myself up so that I don't have that stress of trying to figure out stuff at the last minute because I just hate that it, it annoys me but I say all that to say that this was a hot ticket item in the news amongst the film community this week so I wanted to bring it to your attention and let you know I don't know why um, when it comes to diversity especially in film criticism and with female filmmakers it's always an uphill battle it's always a fight 
it's always you know you always have to to be like ah to to get your voice heard but you know hopefully moving forward everybody will work out the kinks everybody will figure out what is the best way to address these types of issues and we won't have this issue when we hit 2021 um sundance all right so that is the news for this week the films that we, you have to look forward to, the only one that I'm kind of really looking forward to, it well, the two that I'm looking forward to opening is, I know that um, Like a Boss, well, three, <laughs> I lied. <laughs> like a Boss is coming out with my friend Billy Porter and Salma Hayek. That's coming out in January. Um, we also have Bad Boys for Life. Bad Boys, Bad Boys, what you gonna do? What you gonna do when they come for you? That's coming out with my boys Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. Really looking forward to that. And Just Mercy is opening uh, nationwide on January 5th. I know you hear airplane in the background, child. I'm, I'm at home. What can I do? I live by the airport. Um, and that is it. So I hope you enjoy my little walk down memory lane. I hope that you have a happy and healthy 2020. I wish the best for everyone. I want to give a big shout out and thanks to these people because without them, I would not be able to do this. I would love to thank Black Hollywood Live, Daryl Kristen, Kevin Undergaro, Steve Lemieux, <laughs> uh, Bree Phillips, and the rest of the staff. Oh, and my, my producer, Josh, for um helping me put rotten rotten tomato, for helping me put up the curvy critic and giving me insight and helping me grow and helping me change i appreciate y'all so much for every guest that came through here for every person that allowed me to do an interview or approved me to do an interview specifically ginsburg libby y'all are my dogs um thank you so very much i'm so incredibly grateful marshall weinbaum at disney he I don't know where I would be without him. So thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Um, to Fab TV for honoring me with the best TV host award. It was really unexpected. And I was very humbled and very grateful for that. And um, this was the year that I became a Rotten Tomatoes approved critic. I became a member of the Broadcast Film Critics Association, which votes on the Critics' Choice Awards. I became a member of so many other different organizations. I must belong to like six or seven of them, but for all of them that opened me with welcome arms or encouraged me to join, thank you so much for that. And um, last but not least, I want to thank you guys for tuning in every week and listening to me or watching me, whichever the case may be, and supporting me. Trust and believe it does not go unwarranted, it does not go unnoticed, and it definitely doesn't go unappreciated. So, until next year, I will see you then. And you can catch me across all social media platforms at The Curvy Critic, at The Curvy Critic, on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. I'm even on Pinterest. You can find me there right after this next week on january 5th you can find me at the general hospital after show talking all things poor charles <sighs> and oh and tomorrow i almost forgot tomorrow you can catch me on fox 11 la where i will be talking about you know a few little films going into the new year so and thanks again to the fox 11 la family thank you thank you thank you daryl marla and bobby you guys have been so supportive of me and so gracious every time i come there i'd be remiss without shouting you out so until next time if this is your first time joining me again this is the Car the curvy critic with carla renata here at black hollywood live please click the below subscribe button to subscribe. You can catch me on any social media platform at The Curvy Critic. Please follow me or like me or like my page or whatever, and I will like you back. All right, so I will see y'all next week and catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.